Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Beaulieu. Welcome to Lausanne. Uh, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us here for uh, this seminar, which, as you can see, is about achieving the uh, sustainable development goals through sport. It's about partnerships, institutional responses for greater coherence and effectiveness. Um, my name's David Eads. Uh, I work for the BBC, but I see a lot of familiar faces out here, some new ones as well. I suspect on that level alone, we're all in the same boat, because this is a great cross-section here uh, of different paths, different routes, essentially hoping to achieve some of the same goals. It's not the first seminar, it's the second. So from that point of view, it seems to me that, and I'm going to use a sporting analogy, you'll be sick of sporting analogies by the end of today, I'm sure. Um, it's like the second match in a league which has no particular end, except perhaps 2030, and then we can review and see how well that league is going and keep it going. But there is no end to these goals. So yes, this is going to be an important getting to know you session. I think that is clear for many of you. And the panels will reflect that. And we'll hear from uh, Anne Lees a little bit more about that in just a second. But I think also, again, in terms of sport, we all know that once a match has started, a goal scored in the first minute is as valuable as a goal scored in the 90th minute. So there's no time to waste, there's no time to lose, and I think the value of today is about hearing what other people are doing, how you can interact with other people, looking at the successes, the challenges, the opportunities, but let's be open and honest, and it's also a time to look at the difficulties, uh, the obstacles to overcome, perhaps the, the misunderstandings or lack of understanding between some of the different sectors that we have here today. Uh, as I say, you'll hear more about the, the program and how it'll be laid out in just a moment, um, but this event itself is a significant major collaboration of many different forces, uh, and I think um, the first thing I would like to do is ask the uh, State Councillor uh, representative of the Canton de Vaux, uh, that is Philippe Lebas, to say a few words of welcome to all of you, Philippe. Monsieur le directeur de cabinet de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, Monsieur l'ambassadeur Tselweger, Excellence, représentant permanent de la Suisse auprès de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, je crois que Monsieur De Kepper nous rejoindra pour le repas. Mesdames et Messieurs, laissez-moi vous dire tout le plaisir que j'ai au nom de la métropole lémanique qui réunit les cotons de Vaud et de Genève de vous accueillir aujourd'hui à Lausanne, dans la capitale olympique. Je ne peux également que vous remercier d'être venu si nombreux participer à ce séminaire, le deuxième du nom. Plus de 140 personnes inscrites. Un tel nombre ne peut que nous encourager à poursuivre ce travail de mise en commun des compétences et soutenir par différentes actions ce formidable potentiel que vous nous offrez par votre présence dans l'art clémanique. La décision prise par l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies d'adopter les 17 objectifs du développement durable en septembre 2015 a mis l'ensemble des acteurs privés comme publics devant leurs responsabilités. De mes responsabilités de conseiller d'État en charge de l'économie, de l'innovation et du sport, je me dois avec l'ensemble des services et l'ensemble de mes collaborateurs d'intégrer quotidiennement les objectifs du développement durable dans mes prises de décisions politiques et dans le suivi des dossiers. Thus, with regards to the sports sector, we have to make sure on a daily basis that some of the SDGs are constantly supported, developed, and communicated to, to our population, especially to the young population. In this sense, the Youth Winter Olympic Games, which we are proud to host in January 2020, offer a great opportunity to apply many of the, the SDGs to its international organization every day. Put simply, this is a fantastic opportunity to educate the 1,800 young athletes, so that they, they in turn become SDGs ambassadors and transmit these goals to their countries, associations, and clubs. Moreover, by going through the 17 objectives, I believe no few, fewer than six of them are touched by this beautiful event. 
Naturally, this includes the will to work for health and wellness, as well as education and training through the culture and education program, which we are building together with the University of Lausanne and the EPFL. This is only one example out of all the possibilities that sports can offer to make the world a better place. Alors, mesdames et messieurs, profitez de ce programme alléchant, ambitieux, de la formidable qualité des intervenants présents aujourd'hui pour échanger, discuter, débattre, apprendre. Je souhaiterais, pour terminer, remercier très chaleureusement toute l'équipe du comité d'organisation pour le gros travail effectué afin de nous, de vous, permettre de vivre une si riche journée. Je vous remercie. Philippe, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so, what is today all about? Well, uh, there's no one better uh, to inform us and set us on the path uh, this morning than Anne-Lise Favre-Pilet, uh, who's uh, representative of the, the working group on building bridges between international organizations uh, and international sports federations, the IF, um, from the Swiss mission to the uh, UN office at Geneva. Anne-Lise. Merci, David. Monsieur le Conseiller d'État, ladies and gentlemen, dear sport friends. On behalf of the working group, I welcome you today to today's seminar. It is gratifying to see that you are that many. We have about 17 international organizations, of which 12 are part of the UN system, more than 30 sport federations, and as many NGOs and other friends of sport. Many of you were present at our first seminar, which took place in Geneva in January 2016. Recommendations by the participants were pointing at the need to maintain and improve opportunities for knowledge sharing and filling gaps where was needed. Among others, more interacting and networking were required. We have taken these remarks into account And a very successful example of interaction was the gathering last March 2017 on the occasion of Women's Day at the Palais des Nations. International sport federations and international organizations discussed gender issues and on that same day, several international sport federations took a commitment. A commitment not only to promote gender equality, but also to increase representation of women leaders in sporting bodies through the Gender Champions International Network. Today's seminar is another opportunity to bring together the Geneva International Hub of United Nations and other international organizations with sports federation that are mainly based in the Canton de Vaud. The focus today will be on implementing the UN Agenda 2030 for sustainable development around sports through policy documents recently adopted by international organizations and sport federations. The objective of today's seminar is therefore to share, to share information, to share knowledge and know-how, and to share a vision. So first, we have to set up the scene and provide the context for action before being able to get into strategies and implementation. We have therefore asked Mrs. Nadia Isler from the SDGs lab at the United Nations to give us a sense of what the SDGs look like from inside the UN. For the first time, there is a vision that is universal and that is inclusive. The IOC and the International Sport Federations are part of such a global effort. Therefore, with panel number one, the International Olympic Committee will share its sustainability strategy with us. We will see through examples how international federations can implement standards related to human rights, environment, diversity and anti-discrimination, as well as ethical standards and decent work. After an insight of IOC strategies and its work with sport federations, we will see how international organizations and UN agencies implement the SDGs. This will be our panel number two. How do UN agencies work in the field? 
What are the obstacles to be overcome when implementing policies? These are some of the questions that will be addressed. We will then see what institutional responses can be given to multi-stakeholders for achieving SDGs. That's our panel number three. How to implement SDGs according to various partners, stakeholders, actors from different horizons, business, and different corporate culture. From institutional responses, we will narrow our focus on concrete examples of effective and sustainable partnerships. That's our panel number four. That will focus more on achieving SDGs number eight, economic growth and decent work. We will share on sustainable partnerships and the social and economic impact on the sporting value chains. Then with panel number five, our last one, we will share public-private partnerships. We will see how the Commonwealth with its framework supports sport policy makers. We will also hear about the interesting experience of the foundation of the Football Club Barcelona in the field of public-private partnerships. And from a humanitarian perspective, we will see with the UNHCR and the in-zone project of the University of Geneva how PPP can work in refugee context. At the end, our aim is that you leave this day with a better knowledge related to policies and converging strategies around sports, why it is interesting to be part of its implementation, a better knowledge on how to become a valuable partner and contribute to the Agenda 2030, and a better knowledge on other areas that would need attention and could be spearheaded by a number of participants or a cluster. Last but not least, we hope that you will have the opportunity to make new contacts and to expand your network. I should like to close this introduction by addressing my warmest thanks to the members of the working group to the facilitators, to the panelists, as well as to the academic representatives that have worked collaboratively to make this event possible. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very productive day. Annalise, thank you for laying that out so clearly as to what lies ahead of us. Um, and you made the point about uh, we need to know what we're talking about, so let's not assume that everyone knows, and that is the value of, uh, of Nadia joining us here, Nadia Isla from the uh, UN office at Geneva, uh, to lay out the, the SDGs uh, and Agenda 2030, how it fits. Nadia, over to you. Thanks. Monsieur le Conseiller d'État, Madame Favre, dear SDG champions, when the 17 Sustainable Development Goals were adopted at the end of 2015, a remarkable vision was set and a powerful political manifesto was born. It was the first time in history that every single country in the world adopted a common and transformative agenda for the future, which articulated and intertwined in one single document the many dimensions of sustainable development. It marked a unique point in time when the social, economic, and environmental variables of the global equation were made explicit, both in terms of aspirational goals as well as very focused targets. Governments, civil society, communities, businesses, academia, United Nations organizations, and all of you in this room are today looking to turn this vision into practice. We are all striving to break down the complexity of the agenda into concrete and coherent measures that will allow these goals to be met and for their reaching to outlive the test of time. As we look back on the actual process that led to this outcome, the Sustainable Development Goals were and remain nothing less than a remarkable achievement. Since their adoption, thousands of citizens, organizations and institutions have rallied behind this shared outcome, welcoming the universal nature of these objectives and the power of their indivisibility. 
These two instrumental paradigm shifts since the Millennium Development Goals, or the MDGs, have contributed to galvanizing new global energy where civil society in the, south, in the South and in the North are asking for results and where many public and private stakeholders are being pressured to deliver. The universality of the agenda has not only put all countries on an equal basis when it comes to their responsibility to achieve the SDGs at national level, it has also elevated the responsibility at a global level to ensure that we all deliver these results together for our shared planet and shared humanity. In addition to these fundamental changes of paradigm, a powerful principle underpins the entire SDG agenda. No single person, no single country, no single region, and no single stakeholder can nor will achieve these goals alone. Partnerships really are the bedrock of this universal plan and will need to be brought to an entire new level if we are to reach these goals by 2030. As you all know in this room, the volume of countries, organizations, <clears throat> businesses, and people engaged in the actual implementation of Agenda 2030 is so diverse that finding common grounds is more important than ever. It is nothing less than the foundation of an efficient, effective, and long-lasting response to the SDGs. New kind of partnerships are already emerging between and among countries, public sector, the United Nations, businesses, academia, civil society, and many more across regions are being tested and incubated. And we will witness actually throughout this day that many of you are already developing or implementing such joint action through your personal or institutional commitments to turning sport into an active SDG contributor. Sport may not be an SDG per se, but Agenda 2030 does underscore very clearly that sport is, I quote, an important enabler of sustainable development. And it also recognizes more specifically that its contribution, sorry, it, it specifies very clearly its contribution to the empowerment of women and of young people, individuals, and communities. Across the world, sport offers an enabling environment to raise awareness of some of the key drivers of development and peace, such as education, gender equality, health and climate action, and has the power to bring together different actors around a very common objective. Sports also helps eliminate discrimination by breaking down barriers and challenging gender norms, not only on the field of play, but also in the workplace, in the home, in schools, and in other areas of society. In reaching goal three on health, for example, sport also plays an important role, such as in the prevention of non-communicable diseases and mental health issues. And experience has shown also that it can help engage difficult to reach populations and provide very positive role models to convey prevention messages in fields such as HIV, sexual violence, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Sports is also a very natural vector for physical education programs that are recognized as powerful vehicles for teaching children and young people social and life skills, as well as acquiring positive attitudes, values, and moral strength. In reaching goal 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, sports can also provide practical opportunities to engage girls and boys, women and men, to acquire life skills such as teamwork, leadership and respect to promote positive values that have a very lasting impact on building and maintaining peaceful and prosperous societies. In the spirit of the SDGs, today is about exchanging, listening and learning and looking for commonalities and complementarities for enhanced action on Agenda 2030. We very much welcome this initiative and the effort to further build bridges among different stakeholders with a view of amplifying experiences that have demonstrated concrete impact and looking for inspiration for future successful endeavors. In light of the current international context, where natural resources are scarce, 
conflicts and unequal and unprecedented movements of populations are on the rise. Inequality is growing and trust among people is declining. The SDGs represent the historical opportunity to address the very root causes of an unstable environment. They embody nothing less than the only universal and shared vision that will drive us towards taking the measures needed to ensure sustained peace and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Nadia, thank you very much indeed for laying that out so clearly. Okay, Ele Obulo, as they say. Um, our first panel is um, reflecting on uh, the Olympic movement and its work on um, sustainability, the sustainability strategy of the IOC. And you're going to hear from a number of uh, IFs within that framework as well. So what I'd like to do first of all is invite uh, Claude Stricker, along with um, the panelists, to come up on stage. Take a seat. Please come up. Don't be shy. You've got work to do now. Um, and just to point out also, please, come on, um, that there will be an opportunity to hear and there'll be some interaction up on the platform. Uh, and then we will open this up to question and answer sessions. Uh, this will be similar for every panel. So there'll be 15 minutes at the end uh, facilitated by Claude for uh, a question and answer phase. So please be ready with questions. We have microphones either side, and they can come to you. OK, so uh, without further ado, Claude, I leave it uh, in your hands. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. Monsieur le Conseiller d'État, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Madame la Conseiller de la Mission Suisse auprès des Nations Unies, dear sport friends, this is a pleasure to participate to such a platform of dialogue between sports, sport stakeholders, international uh, sport federation, and international organization. In particular, with this first session. It's a, a great pleasure to uh, welcome our panelists, and uh, we will uh, first uh, introduce Mrs. Julie Dufus from the International Olympic Committee, uh, who uh, is an experienced sustainability professional with over 20 years in the international field, worked on high-profile projects, international uh, organization project and in particular the Olympic Games and um, just saying that uh, Julie is probably the only sustainability manager in the world who has worked on two with two organizing uh, Olympic Games committee so long experience and um, we're very happy that you will share this experience today and as well coordinate uh, the dialogue with the International Federation I would like also to welcome Mrs. Uh, Gloria Scarano from the uh, International Mountaineering Association, UIAA. Um, Mrs. Uh, Scarano is uh, manager of the mountain protection project, combining environmental sustainability with outdoor activities and sport. She has also an experience with the uh, Winter Olympic Games, having been working with uh, Torino 2006. And uh, we are also very glad to have the uh, Taekwondo International Federation, and in particular the Taekwondo Humani Humanitarian Foundation, very active uh, in sustainability with Mrs. Delphine Schmutz, who is the office manager holding a bachelor degree in political science and international relations from the University of Lausanne and having worked, been involved with the World Taekwondo uh, operation, in particular the creation of the foundation since the beginning, since several years. I would like also to welcome uh, from uh, the world of sailing, so World Sailing Federation, Mr. Dan Reading, who uh, is the sustainability program manager and uh, have also long experience in, uh, in uh, the sport, being uh, nine years at the Royal Yachting Association and British Marine. 
And last but not least, I would like to welcome Mr. Frederico Adietti, if I pronounce this correctly, who is the head of sustainability and diversity at uh, FIFA, um, being in charge with FIFA of all the CSR, corporate social responsibility and humanitarian activity of uh, this uh, world football governing body and all the relationship with the United Nations system. So thank you very, very much for sharing uh, your expertise now and I would like to ask Julie you. to uh, start presenting actually the key role that IOC is playing now with sustainability. Thank you very much, Claude, and thank you for everyone for inviting me to be here today. It, it really is a pleasure. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the IOC sustainability strategy, and it very much started with Agenda 2020, and that was the stepping stone that we needed to move away from a traditional philanthropic approach to one where sustainability is integral to the culture of the IOC. We only have to look at some of our missions, such as promote sport and the Olympic values in society with a focus on young people, or even the Olympic Charter, or even going back further to the fundamental principle of modern Olympism that plans sport at the service of the harmonious development of humankind. To see that the world of sport cannot stand by, immune from, and aloof from the global sustainability challenges of our time. And the IOC is ready and wants to respond to this. We have many dedicated programmes focusing on the contribution of sport to health and well-being, education, peace and the environment. I'm not going to go into great depth on this sustainability strategy because I want to leave some time for the federations. But I will explain a little bit about the high-level targets and the framework which we're work working towards. You'll see here that we very much work on three spheres. We've got the IOC as an organisation where we have direct control. We have the IOC as owner of the Olympic Games, where we have some control, some influence. And then we have IOC as leader of the Olympic movement. Here we don't have direct control. However, the impacts here are huge and are global reaching. So what we've done is that we've focused all of the SDGs, all of our work, into five spheres. And here we can see infrastructure and natural sites, sourcing and resource management, mobility, workforce, and climate. And the vision is to put a, build a better world through sport. I personally look after the Olympic movement side, and the Olympic movement is all of the federations. That's 35 um, international Olympic federations, there's 35 recognised, and then there's 206 national Olympic committees. And at the heart of the Olympic movement is this vision, which is underpinned by our three core values of excellent respect and fr friendship. The IOC, being the supreme authority of Olympic movement, fully recognises the responsibility that comes with this and the UN recognition. And as such, we are willing and ready to assume a leadership role on behalf of the sporting community in helping the world realise the SDGs. So if you look at these five focus areas, our core objectives are very much focused on supporting and providing guidance to those who require it. We see our role as a facilitator and enabler, and us, combined with Olympic solidarity, are ready to assume this role. So we as the IOC are focusing um, on 11 of the SDGs. And in September 2015, as you all probably know, the UN General Assembly confirmed the important role sport plays in SDGs. And we very much want to further embed sustainability in our activities where we can reinforce the IOC's contribution to the SDGs. And this is the whole ambition of our IOC strategy. So without further ado, I want to open the floor up to the international federations. We have a mixture here of indoor and outdoor sports, um, and they're all trying really hard to implement the SDGs. So as you're on our right, Gloria, I will start with you. Okay. <laughs> um, 
We all know that very much the future of your sport ultimately relies on the natural ecosystems of mountains. But what are the biggest threats that you are seeing to these ecosystems? And what are you, the UIAA doing to try and reduce these threats? You're right. Mountains are among the ecosystems that need to be protected. And even if they are huge, they are very fragile. So the threats cannot really be identified in one because there is climate change as a consequent natural disasters. There is the isolation of the mountain communities, deforestation, the increase of waste, uh, and uh, also of motor vehicle in natural area. So there are so many. And that's why the UIA, the International Climbing and Mountaineering Federation, cares about sustainability. Uh, we have a Mountain Protection Commission already since 50 years. It was founded in 1969, so it's not a new thing to us. And the main goal of the Mountain Protection Commission is to maintain the mountain safe for the future generation of mountaineers, hikers, and simply mountain lovers. So they do so uh, raising awareness to these threats and also, um, and also um, sharing the best practices to behave in the nature. Uh, they do so with many projects. The biggest two at the moment are the Mountain Protection Award and the Respect the Mountains. So Mountain Protection, Mountain Protection Award, MPA, is an annual award that since 2013 um, acknowledged the proactive efforts in, in terms of uh, environmental protection. Um, every applicant from all over the world can apply as long as they are active in five of our main areas, which are the conservation of biodiversity, uh, the sustainable management of resources, so energy and water, the sustainable uh, management of waste and their disposal, the mitigation of the effects of the climate change, and then uh, um, the, um, the culture and education in terms of mountain protection. Yeah. So the Mountain Protection Commission is then active in terms of innovation research mm. in this case. With respect to mountains, it's more an activity on the educational field because it's a series of events. We had nine this summer uh, in all over Europe and also one in Canada for the first time. And uh, with many volunteers, participants that come, we sh clean up the mountains and then we have some outdoor activities in the afternoon to enjoy staying together. And in this occasion, it's, it's a good chance for us to share our seven ways to respect the mountains, which are not rocket science. They are very basic concepts like leave no trace or travel wise to the mountains. And because in this way, we don't want to teach them like theoretically, but we really want to show how we should behave. I think it's like the IOC would like to bring sustainability into everyday operation. Mm -hmm. As well, the UIA would like this best practice to become reality so that the SDGs could, could become yeah. real. Yeah. So it goes well beyond SDG 15, but actually touches many of the others, 3, 4, 11, 17, many others. Um, you talk about education and awareness. Um, how do you make sure that all the good work that you do sort of carries on on a day-to-day -day basis in the mountains? You, you're right. You mentioned, again, you mentioned uh, the climate change action, the... the sustainable cities, the protect ecosystems, all of these have education in common. So education is the key. Educational are our projects because we want to have a practical impact. With MPA, we, just don't, we don't just give an award, but we also give a platform. So the project, the applicants can, can network and can have uh, partnerships. With uh, respect to mountains, we create ourselves I mean, uh, partnerships with local organizers, with our member federations, 
with our with other NGOs and MPOs, we share the expertise of the delegates of the Mountain Protection Commission so that they can go to conferences or they can come to ours or they can go to school and speak to, to scholars. Mm -hmm. In exchange, for example, our helping clubs put make sure to put into practice our ways to respect the mountain. So not just when the UIA is there organizing mm -hmm. an event, but for every excursion. Then, of course, there are challenges and difficulties um, because, for example, for especially for big and famous sports, uh, there could be intrinsic difficulties, like also uh, it's difficult to keep sustainable an event that brings together a lot of people. Mm. But at the same time, there are also external challenges, like the, in our field for sustainability, the difficulty of finding sponsors. Mm. So all of these make more difficult to deliver the SDGs. Mm. But I believe that um, if we find partners, both other federations or sponsors that share these sustainable development goals, uh, we could we could really create something. We could go in the, mm. in yeah, the right definitely. direction. Yeah, I think um, today we'll show how partnerships are really key and important in this work. So thank you. Thank you. Um, it's excellent to hear from UIA, who's quite a relatively small federation yeah. compared to some of the others here, and it's really good to see how what a great job they're doing. So I'm going to move on to Delphine from World Taekwondo. We've been speaking a bit this year about your gender equality, which I think is as a program has really raised the bar in sport, um, especially in a combat sport where it's often viewed as quite a male-dominated sport. How did this come about and what processes have you put in place and challenges have you mm -hmm. faced during this gender equality program? Yes, it's true that as a martial arts and combat sport, uh, there is gener uh, gen generally a gender bias towards... Uh, we just picture us, um, this sport as being rather male-dominated, but in fact there are um, just the same amount of uh, events uh, for female and male athletes. But one of the specific measures that World Taekwondo has uh, undertaken, it was already in Rio last year, um, was uh, to take this strategic decision of, um, of um, sending uh, a 50-50 split of referees, 50% male and 50% female, which was before not the case. It was rather roughly about 70% male to 30% female referees. And now we have just decided that uh, on all of WT uh, sanctioned events, uh, there would be automatically half of the referees um, would be female and half would be male. And also, um, the referees, they are allocated randomly to the matches that they have to officiate at. So it means that you can have a female referee uh, arbitrating a match between two heavyweight uh, male <coughs> athletes, for example, which also um, shows that um, we don't make any distinction based on gender, there is no distinction of, of capacity or strength, and we just we really want to encourage all of our member national federations to, um, to raise the bar as well uh, on that uh, issue in their own events, and um, some of our continental unions have already started to take over the practice as well. Obviously, one of the main challenges that we faced uh, enforcing this decision was that at the beginning we didn't have enough female referees uh, that were qualified for international competitions. So we heavily focused on referee education <coughs> and uh, we did also obviously mixed uh, referee seminars, which was also not the case previously. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully um, this will create a snowball effect because the idea is eventually to encourage um, equal opportunities, equal participation of women in all in all the various roles that can be undertaken within a federation within our sports. Mm. It's really fantastic, something that all of us, I think, can learn from. Um, in addition to that, you also have the Taekwondo Humanitarian Foundation. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because obviously, um, I guess some would question putting a combat sport in a refugee camp could have some issues, but how have you integrated the values of Taekwondo into, into these camps? Yes, so um, last year, um, 
the World Taekwondo uh, Federation created this uh, humanitarian foundation with, with the purpose to uh, address the refugee crisis through our specialization, which is Taekwondo, um, by trying to add value to um, a response, a global response. We don't pretend that we know how to uh, bring uh, food and shelter to people in crisis. However, we are specialists over sports that we believe strongly can help bring mental and physical well-being to practitioners, whether they are um, normal life people or people who actually have even spe more special needs. And um, we do get this question often that, uh, why would you teach a combat sport to people who suffered from civil war or conflict? And um, the very simple response is, whoever has ever practiced martial arts knows that one of the core value is non-violence and the respect of uh, your opponent or the respect of others. And through the Taekwondo, we hope to um, um, give refugee children, especially uh, who are now practicing in, in some of the camps where we have uh, projects, so in Jordan and Rwanda or Turkey, for example, we hope to give them a, a, a safe space to discover physical activity, rediscover it, and um, develop um, those kind of values um, that are amazing. Uh, I mean, that sport is amazing at transmitting. So, um, yes, just respect of the broad discipline, fair play, teamwork, mm -hmm. and Taekwondo, just, is just like many sports, uh, can, can bring that. The advantage of Taekwondo is that is, it is a very cheap sport to, to do. There is no need of any equipment except the the human body, so mm. it makes it quite easy to um, to dispatch or to develop in, in, in um, limited resources environments. And um, we definitely try to um, make our projects sustainable in the long term. In that we work closely with the local federation, national federations that are uh, located in the pro in the area where we uh, intervene. Uh, we try to have them send their own local coaches or instructors to the refugee camp, which also is a two-way um, exchange because then um, it's, uh, it allows for a better inclusion as well of this refugee uh, population within, um, eventually within uh, the host community where they are. Um, yeah. It's really fun. It makes me quite emotional to <laughs> listen to you speaking. It's, it's an amazing project. Thank you. Dan from World Sailing. Um, so recently you had a new CEO, <coughs> Andy Hunt, who um, I'm fortunate to know quite well, but he really put a new push to this, your sustainability <coughs> program. And I know that in the last few months you've really setting some ambitious targets for 2030. Could you explain a little bit about how this came about and how you're implementing and working out what these targets are going to be? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, first of all, we started off with um, more of a kind of a survey of our members, so um, our national authorities, our athletes, um, and also um, some of our sponsors and other people. And what we found was that the majority of sailors, and I don't know if there's any in the room, that had this kind of natural um, kind of passion for the environment because we sort of used, we, we harnessed the wind, so we harnessed the natural um, elements. Um, and also seeing firsthand how we have some of our ocean sailors who are going across um, oceans where not many people um, are, are able to enjoy, and they're seeing plastics and they're seeing you know different bits of pollution. So it was, we had a lot of people very passionate about it. So what we tried to do is set up an Agenda 2030, um, which looked to implement some of the sustainable development goals across the sports. So um, we have both the kind of the Olympic classes, which is one section of our. Um, participation, but we also have things like the Volvo Ocean Race, um, the America's Cup, where we have some amazing um, sort of technology. So mm -hmm. seeing how we could some, somehow harness that for the better. Excellent. So a lot of people would associate um, sailing with may, maybe just SDG 14, but I know that you have ambitions to go way beyond that <coughs> and implement a lot of other SDGs. Could you explain more about the other ones? Absolutely. We've got some, um, some really ambitious targets. Um, so our Agenda 2030 is going to be launched in November. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, and then it's going to be open to sort of consultation, so hoping to get feedback from um, people in this room and lots of different partners um, and some of the aspects that we're, we're, we're trying to target. Some of the things like um, the end of life of boats, so we have boats made from um, GRP, so glass reinforced plastic, which is also an issue for the um, wind turbine industry, so we're hoping to kind of partner um, with industry to look at some of those key, key issues. Um, also gender equality, um, looking at having a similar kind of trying to get more athletes into the sport. Um, we're changing some of the rules for our competition. Um, we have mixed, I think we're one of the only Olympic um, disciplines where we have a, um, a mixed um, sort of boat. So we have uh, both male and female competing together against each other. Um, and also trying to really make sure that um, the, through the training, um, where because it's a technical sport, um, we can integrate some sustainability messages in the training for when people are first getting into it. So trying to promote some of the goals to uh, the younger generation. Mm. Excellent, ambitious targets. So Dan, I've known you for many, many years, and um, we worked together in London 2012, where we really saw how important it was for a sustainable supply chain. It was really key to how you deliver your targets. Um, do you have any ambitions against your supply chain and how are you going to use them to deliver your targets and your SDGs? Absolutely. I mean, we have our kind of our direct supply chain, so um, people hosting um, events on our behalf. So we're changing the whole bid process um, to make sure that they um, conform to um, our standards. So we're talking about ISO 2012-1, for example. Um, and also um, making sure that they're sort of abiding by our Agenda 2030. Um, furthermore, we're looking to um, engage with all of the equipment. So we use a lot of equipment uh, in our sport. So not only do you have uh, the boats that are kind of competing, but we have the support boats as well, so with engines. So looking to um, promote the kind of hybrid technology. So looking to um, some of the more um, commercial partners to try and get technologies that are used for, for our sport, which can be used for um, general purpose in terms of people cruising um, boats, but not necessarily competing. So definitely our supply chain is something that we want to um, uh, engage with. Um, mm. So we want to work with them um, and also try and to um, change some of the rules so perhaps um, there's a little bit of a stimulus for them to, uh, to, to change as well. Yeah. And I think this shows how important partnerships are because we're trying to do the same in the IOC and a lot of what we're doing, some of the same suppliers around the sport industry. So, yeah, partnerships are key. Thank you, Dan. So last but not least, Federico. Um, FIFA is a, a huge organisation. I think you've got 210 national... 11. National... OK, 211 national football um, associations. And you touch the lives of billions of people, um, not just through sport, but through job creation, infrastructure building, and capacity building. But with that um, comes a, a global footprint and risks, risks to human and labour rights. How are you addressing that within FIFA, and what sort of challenges have you had along the way? Uh, well, the challenges are many. Uh, but let me first, uh, if, if I may, make a, a reflection on, on the evolution that uh, the world of sports have made and, and some uh, use the uh, introduction that Professor uh, Schrick had made on, uh, about myself. He mentioned that I was working on CSR, on humanitarian activities at FIFA, and on the relationship with the UN uh, uh, system. Uh, actually, we don't call CSR anymore. This is probably a, an introduction of a work that I was doing 13 or 14 years ago at FIFA. But the, the, uh, the work that we're actually doing, we, call it, we don't call it anymore CSR. So we, we talk about sustainability using all three dimensions of uh, sustainability, economic, the social, and the environmental ones. So it has been an evolution, not just with FIFA, but within the world of sports toward uh, um, uh, sustainability, integrating sustainability in the work we do. We do little, very little humanitarian work from a strict definition of humanitarian work perspective uh, and we do our main role is that of integrating really sustainability within the management and operations of our activities and our sports and uh, last but not least and here I, this is to exemplify the uh, the uh, challenge one of the challenges the relationship with the UN system and I think that is a good forum as well to discuss about it we had a different type of relationship or we had kind of relationship many years ago, the relationship today is not as good as it could be. So definitely I hope that this forum and other forums and, and future interactions will help us as well strengthen the opportunities and the synergies that exist in the United Nations system as well as in the sports world. 
you mentioned uh, um, challenges in connection with, with our activities uh, uh, and related to human rights, labor rights. Uh, we have uh, taken um, very recently uh, acknowledged that uh, FIFA has a responsibility towards protecting human rights in connection with the major construction projects related to our activities. Uh, uh, st until 2011, the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights didn't exist, so there was no international framework for even for uh, the corporate sector, but also for the world of sports to align with. We have taken the UN guiding principles as our gui guidance in order to address our responsibility, and we have acknowledged that although the stadiums are not built by us. The stadiums are not uh, um, even commissioned by us. We don't have contracts with the, with the um, um, companies building them. Uh, there is still under the UNGP's a responsibility, which, uh, which we take seriously. So that led, uh, that acknowledgement and the alignment with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights led to, uh, in first place, to an analysis that was commissioned to uh, Professor John Ruggie, uh, the father of the uh, UN guiding principles, about analyzing the gaps that existed between the uh, things that we were doing at FIFA and our expected responsibility associated with, with the UNGPs. So that led to a series of recommendations, and among them uh, the integration of uh, uh, human rights um, uh, due diligence processes, the uh, creation and integration of human rights considerations in our uh, statutes, uh, which we did at the beginning of this year. There is a, sp a special article on on uh, the protection and promotion of human rights, as Article 3 of the FIFA statutes. Uh, we developed this year uh, a human rights, a dedicated human rights policy, and, uh, and uh, have a due diligence process in place to address all those issues. Uh, the challenges that you find when trying to uh, uh, analyze your risks and, and uh, find solutions to them and find remedy in some cases are that we go into different places around the world, so you have different types of legislations, uh, and uh, some of the legislations, depending on the country you are, with a major sport event like the World Cup, are supportive of your endeavors. Uh, if we would have a World Cup in Switzerland, then the, uh, the legislation would help us a lot, uh, and even the enforcing mechanisms would help us a lot. If you go to countries like uh, Russia or Qatar, the situation is different. Uh, but at the same time, those challenges uh, generate opportunities opportunities for us to raise the bar for our projects uh, so that that uh, uh, higher uh, bar can also permeate the, uh, the local environment, so the standards that we define for the construction and for the protection of workers uh, and, and uh, human rights in those countries are higher standards than the ones that have been used, are being used and enforced uh, in, in the countries themselves. So we are trying as well that in addition to taking our own responsibility and making sure we protect and we have the right mechanisms to protect human rights and labor rights in those, uh, in those uh, environments, that that uh, has as well a spillover effect on the, uh, on the situation in the host country. And that is um, a great opportunity uh, coming out from a, from a challenge. We're seeing that very clearly in, in Russia and in Qatar, where our standards for monitoring uh, um, working conditions, labor standards, health and safety in the, in the state and construction of the infrastructure for the World Cup uh, are much higher than the local standards. And uh, um, s uh, slowly but surely, other industries and other actors in those uh, environments start applying the same standards that are being applied at the World Cup uh, construction sites. So these are, this is, this is uh, one of, uh, of the challenges that is, is combined with an opportunity. Another challenge is, of course, uh, for us, the, the life cycle, the long life cycle of an event. Uh, and this is something that we start, we try as much as possible to use international standards that are existing. We do not reinvent the wheel. There are many standards that can be applied in our operation, our sustainability management. And, uh, uh, but these standards are, exist today, and uh, our events take place in seven, eight, ten, twelve years' time. So it is important that we remain flexible, and uh, by the time we're implementing it, uh, we start considering uh, um, uh, how to implement them, that we take that element into consideration. It's not always easy when you get closer to the event uh, to still try and to enforce some of the requirements that you set up in the bidding process ten years ago. Uh, so that as well, uh, I'm not saying that it's, a, it's an unsolvable problem, but it's, some, it's one of the problems that we definitely need to address. And this is something we are addressing now in the, for example, when it comes to human rights and labor rights issues, to a very strong integration of, uh, of requirements for the next uh, bidding process. Uh, so it will be announced in the next uh, couple of weeks. 
uh, but there is a, a really strong integration and of requirements for the host countries about what are the expectations with regards to respect uh, of human rights and labor rights in connection with the event. And, and the, the third, perhaps, the, the challenge that everyone has is uh, resources. So it doesn't matter how big you are, how wealthy you are as an organization, resources are always limited. And therefore, you would always like to do more, uh, but there are limitations to what you can do. And there's there where uh, strategic planning comes uh, uh, into place, and you have to make decisions on where, uh, what are your material issues, what are your salient risks, and whether you uh, invest your resources in the most, most uh, mm. um, wisely, actually. I think all the three challenges you've said really resonates with me working in the Olympic committees because that's exactly what we were facing. And I saw the difference between having an Olympic Games hosted in London compared to Rio. You know, the regulations, the resources, um, it was just such on a different scale that it was, it was hard to implement one thing to the other. So I really resonate on that. Um, I also know that you have recently, well, last year, in fact, signed a pledge with UNFCCC on climate change. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you're tackling that on this act, urgent action for climate change? Well, I, I mentioned before the relationship with the UN uh, system, with the UNFCCC, it's, it's actually been very uh, straightforward, a very, uh, very positive, very pragmatic one. Uh, and it was, I would say, an, an easy uh, one for us as well because we have been working on climate change and, and taking uh, the uh, responsibility about the environmental impact that, that we have through our activities since uh, at least started 2006, but, but more comprehensively since 2009, where we know since then what is our impact, the impact of our activities, what is our carbon footprint, what is the carbon footprint and the impact of uh, our, our FIFA World Cup and events. Uh, we measure it. We have have um, reduction measures in order to, as much as possible, reduce that, uh, that environmental impact. And then we offset uh, uh, the remaining uh, emissions that, uh, that, that we have through those at FIFA and, and, and at, the, uh, at the FIFA World Cup. So um, it was a, an easy step, I would say, uh, to enter into this partnership and to pledge as the first sport organization uh, in this year um, to, uh, to the Climate Neutral Now campaign, and, and we, uh, we decided to do it, uh, continuing what we have already started, so becoming carbon neutral by 2050, and having an operations which are uh, um, uh, conscious of the, of the environment by, again, measuring the impact of the FIFA World Cup and our activities uh, uh, permanently, uh, having a concrete plans in order to reduce that impact as much as possible, and offsetting all of the emissions that are remain, as that are, which are actually part of our under our operational control. Uh, so this is what we are already doing. The FIFA World Cup in Brazil, 2014, was already uh, from that perspective had already achieved that goal, and we have the same uh, objectives for 2018 in Russia and 2022 in in uh, in Qatar. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, well, I think we'll open up the, to the floor for questions, but um, just to say that I'm, I'm really proud to take the floor with these four people. They're very inspiring in what they do. Thank you, Julie. So if uh, in the audience you would have a question, please, that's the moment. Just say your name. I don't know if we have a microphone, but I think, yeah, we have one there. All right. Um, uh, it's a question for Federico, actually, just on the last, almost the last thing you said there about the, uh, um, the uh, goal to be carbon neutral for um, major events by 2050. And I just wonder if I could challenge you a bit on how, really, how ambitious or otherwise that is. 2050 is an awful long way away. Um, I didn't say that we wanted to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050 with the events. The events are already, as of 2014, carbon neutral from, from that perspective and, and following the, uh, the, uh, the requirements of, of this Climate uh, Neutral Now campaign. Uh, it, it is for the entire organization to become carbon neutral by then. Uh, I think that uh, th there is, uh, for the time being, um, if you have the financial resources to offset your emissions, it's, um, it's an easily achievable goal. Uh, the challenge remains in how you make sure you uh, not just rely on offsetting at the end and you don't care about how your impact has been, but you 
really analyze what your impact is and see what are the, uh, the so-called hotspots, where is it really that you can make a difference through concrete actions as they were mentioned before, where is it? Is the, uh, is the infrastructure that's being used for a sport relevant in order to reduce uh, sailings uh, impact on the environment. This is the same, the same thing we do. We try to identify those uh, uh, hotspots and make sure that we have innovative uh, um, partnership solutions where we can reduce that impact as much as possible. It remains, as it was said at the beginning, it is difficult for a large event like the FIFA World Cup not to have an event. I mean, every human activity, even the fact that we are here today, we are having an impact on, on our planet. Uh, so it is important, first place, to understand it and second place to take uh, responsibility for it and, and try to do something about it. Um, the bigger the event, uh, the bigger the challenge, but uh, we're here to take it. Okay. More question? Yes. Hi, good. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Rohit Ramesh. I'm coming from the World Baseball and Softball Confederation. Um, there's one thing in baseball and softball, it, it's, you know, the events are there, they have big, big stadiums, and it's the same <coughs> thing. It's much bigger for FIFA. And, um, well, you're talking about the events and how you can reduce emissions and a carbon footprint and offset it. But then you have to, uh, looking at a step back about even constructing stadiums, it's a lot of... Uh, emissions, you know, the way you have to do it, the materials that you use. And considering that you have this concept of sustainable cities that is coming, uh, what, what do you, have you thought about what has to be done before, like for Qatar especially, and yeah, maybe in Russia as well. So is there anything that is in plan for a step before while constructing uh, stadiums? Uh, definitely there are steps before, that's what I was mentioning at the beginning with the, uh, with the long life cycle of the event. The sooner you integrate that, uh, and you cannot do it sooner than the, the bidding process, and that's where it has to be, uh, the, the sooner you integrate those requirements in the bidding process and in the hosting agreements, then the easier it is to have it enforced in the, uh, in the implementation. We have set up already for, uh, after the experience in Brazil, uh, a very um, uh, concrete requirements with regards to the design and construction of stadiums. So we, all the FIFA World Cup stadiums have to be, uh, have to have a green building certification, either LEED uh, to a certain degree or equivalent. Uh, so we have, through that requirement, even created in Russia, for example, a new standard for design and construction of sport infrastructure when it comes to green building uh, certification. So there were no standards existing in the country. Of course, the Russians didn't want to use LEED or BRIAM because the places they're coming from. And, uh, and definitely they, uh, they decided to create their own one. So this is already a legacy, a spillover effect of that requirement. But these requirements have to be in place from the very beginning. If you have them there, then it's easier to, to enforce them. If you don't have them there, it's not impossible, but it's more challenging. Uh, and, and that is, that is one of, uh, of the things that you, you try to integrate in, in connection with Russia and in Qatar, which leads to a more sustainable design and construction of, of infrastructure. We support as well, the, uh, through uh, capacity building initiatives, the uh, uh, sustainable management uh, capacity building for stadiums. So we, we work with all stadium authorities and stadium uh, um, uh, managing companies in order to strengthen their ability to manage the stadiums in a sustainable way, although they have been built in a certain design and built in a certain way, we want them as well to be managed in a certain way uh, long after the, the event. And, um, and definitely that's, uh, that's something which in the field of environmental uh, protection or, or contribution to, to uh, reducing our impact on the, on the planet uh, uh, has, has had very, very positive effect. On the human rights part and how you protect as well the, uh, the impacts that the construction of a stadium can have, uh, there are many uh, things that you can integrate in the, uh, in the bidding process. That's, as I said, what we're doing for 2026. It's not something that we had in 2010 with the non-existence of the UN guiding principles at the time. We didn't have a reference to use for the bidding processes for Russia and, and Qatar. But that doesn't mean that we will wait only until 2026 to implement and we have raised in cooperation with the local organizing committees, the, uh, the standards for uh, human rights protection, labor rights protection, health and safety, uh, uh, working conditions in general for those uh, construction sites of the FIFA World Cup already in the implementation phase, irrespective of the non-existing of abiding uh, uh, contract with them. Hi, 
uh, I'm Pavla Foley. I'm a recent graduate from the ASTS, and I'm working currently with Julie in the IOC. With and I was lucky enough to work with all the panelists on specific case studies and sustainability, and uh, along with other international federations. So my question today to actually all of you, uh, because it was really interesting to see all the projects that the federations are doing, uh, and I think the the reason for today as well is to really share this experience. So if you could all give uh, one or two sentences about how could other federations go along with implementing projects. So for instance, for you, Delphine, what would a federation need to do? What are the kind of three key steps to take in order to have a 50-50 split in referees? Or for Gloria, how could other federations implement an award and uh, use it for recognizing good projects in sustainability. Thank you. Start? Well, for the, for the referee 50-50 um, split, I think it's just about um, knowing what um, define, we just need to define what the target is and then we just give ourselves the means to get there. And if we know why we're doing this and if we are, we have the, uh, capacity to advocate enough about why we're doing this, I don't see why it's not possible to get there. And um, I, we didn't get any uh, resistance from any of our members uh, about the gender equality thing. So if we just, I think now everybody, everybody in the world knows that we are in a way on the same boat and that there are a lot of challenges that are not um, Constrict, const, con, con, they're, they're, they're not just in one country. Every, everything spreads, especially in, in terms of sustainability. All the issues there, it's, it's, there's no uh, limits to where it can go. So we are all in a way in the same boat. So whenever we uh, uh, define a good solution, um, or we just have an idea, and then we just give ourselves the means, and we can go, we can go there. Um, I think I am. Um I work a lot with the international federations and the NOCs and some of them are very much at the beginning of their journey so, and I can't compare one to another so I can't compare Switzerland for example to Micronesia. It has to be a sustainability strategy that is relevant for them and a lot of the time I give them advice to work out what impacts do you have or what impacts does your sport have and where do you want to be in by 2020, 2030 and then look at where you want to be and then work backwards and define how to get there and how to set up your targets. And I often say to people, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be simple, but as long as you're stepping in the right direction, where there's a lot of people here, including the IOC and all of us together, who are willing to support um, people who are starting on their journey on writing a sustainability strategy. I wanted to add maybe also that maybe some federations can be a bit um, scared to take too much of a big stance towards sustainability because in the end it's a big responsibility if we say that we want to uh, reach that certain goal then then we have to actually <laughs> deliver behind it so um, but um, on for the World Taekwondo the experience was that actually all of the members were really happy to to uh, to help and to to move in that direction and there was already then we found out that there were a lot of individual or local uh, projects or um, initiatives that were already going on that we had absolutely no idea were going on towards uh, some of those sustainability goals so it's just sometimes about opening the dialogue as mm. well and see what we want to do together being brave enough to make that step mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps I, I can challenge you back. Uh, if, uh, I think that I'm not that uh, uh, sure that at the top level of the international federations there is a clear understanding of what sustainability is and why we should be all aligned around this. Uh, I very much believe that we will find consensus in this room and everyone will agree that we are on the same boat, we live in the same planet, we are part of the same society, and, and we want to go into the right direction. And why shouldn't we want to be sustainable? I mean, it's like, you don't want to be successful, you don't want to be, have it, be happy. For us, it is so natural to understand that, but it's not natural for everyone. So when it comes to, uh, uh, in our case, the reality of, uh, of uh, some of the national associations in football we work with, or I can understand as well the reality of some of the smaller 
international uh, uh, f um, sports federations. I'm part of the board of the Swiss Volleyball Federation, a small federation in Switzerland, and, and we understand the challenges in a different manner. Uh, but I think that there is a, a number of, of federations which will have a natural, uh, either a leader or a, a strong sustainability manager in the organization, or someone within the organization which will, who will push the agenda. But in many cases, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. So that motivation to do something needs to come from those who have the resources. And I think that there the IOC has a role to play. Uh, there are mechanisms that you have in place with some of the programs that you offer to us as international federations where you offer resources for us to start doing something uh, or to present a project to you. I think you could be more targeted in saying, well, we expect you to do something in order to address the sustainability matters in your own federations, in your own sport. And here are the resources that you have in place, even if it's a small amount. For many, for us, perhaps it will not be necessary, but for many others, it is a huge boost to that motivation for doing something and starting, perhaps in an opportunistic manner, as we did 14 years ago, saying, okay, this is, this is where we're going. Yeah, there's a great social uh, responsibility project, or there is a great initiative here, small program on protection of the environment. Let's start with that one. It, it needs to start, and, but sometimes the motivation needs to come from those who have the resources. The same for us with our member association. We can we are funding our member associations, and we have a, a, a leverage there in order to make sure that they, if they want, we have the resources to put in place for them to start this sustainability journey. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that, and I think the IOC recognizes that as well. And um, I've been in the role nearly a year now, but one of the reasons I was brought on was to do exactly as you said, and work with Olympic Solidarity on the funding, etc. But again, resources is, is even a bit of a blunder for us. I mean, we give away, I think, 97 or so percent of our income. So um, definitely agree with you. But it's, again, not a limit, limitless pot that we need to all work together um, to realise our, our goals in sustainability. Um, if I could just jump in, one of the things that um, we did to start off with our um, sort of sustainability initiative was to appoint an independent commission. So they so formulated of um, ten different people from around the world to kind of look at our um, organisation, our activities, and to identify what the key issues were. So that gave us a kind of a starting point. Um, but also asking our members what were they already doing, because I've come from a, um, a national authority and um, have been involved with, with that for nine years, um, sort of. Um, creating a sustainability initiative. So we're trying to sort of um, not reinvent the wheel, but capitalise on the work that's already been done and, and exactly looking to um, some of the case studies. So we're trying to um, have a gender equality for some of our race officials, which sort of complements. So it, that's why working, when I speak to some of our stakeholders, we can say other federations are doing it succeeding. Um, so we can sort of um, use them as best practice. Um. And if I may add something to what Federico said, it's clear we have partners that want to be sustainable. But for some of us, for example, I come from a small federation, we have also partners, other MPOs or charity, local, national, which are sustainable, are active in this field, but they have different aims. So sometimes there is also these difficulties. Because I think what today uh, Madame Favre Pillet said about sharing, it's important. So we share values with our partners. Then we share also knowledge. So we create platform like today we are here for also networking because of networking. But then uh, there is uh, sometimes there could be difficulties. Uh, well, pra an example. Recently, I had to step back from a collaboration with a local partner because in organizing our Respect the Mountain event, they wanted to go up to 3,000 meters to clean up the area. We want to be inclusive. We want to approach more people. I mean, we want families to know our sports. So for me, 3,000 meters wasn't really what I wanted. We want to keep close so the people can come also by train or bus, public transportation. And so this was a charity. They are sustainable, but we have different aims. So that's also mm -hmm. another thing. I think it's very important to be clear, clear about where we want to go. Mm. Definitely. So just this, this way we can deliver our sustainable goals. Definitely. Okay. You can speak. 
Yes, sorry, I got a mic. Uh, I'm uh, Neva Novokashinovic, uh, represent focal point for Enzo Youth and the United Nations major group of children and youth. And while uh, listening and being inspired by all the work you are doing, um, one uh, thing is not in line with, with your work and your speeches. And it is this uh, picture behind you, which is showing um, the goals that are in line with you and SDGs. Uh, why only 11 SDGs are in line with sports when you are already doing much more and you are contributed to all? Uh, for instance, the youth in sports last year developed the long-term know-how um, program, that is, which is the idea to bring it as a side event workshops to uh, diverse major sport events around the world. Um, and we already succeeded to show that it is possible with uh, the skills and the capacities of sports to implement all 17 SDGs through sports. Uh, it is possible and we shall do it. We shall take it as our mission. We have so far uh, implemented these workshops with the uh, European Athletics during uh, their indoor and outdoor championships and we are really looking forward to bring it to all these diverse federations and events uh, and to show that uh, sports uh, shall be for all 70s. Um, because here we are missing, for instance, goal six, which is uh, establishing clean, uh, clean waters for all. Sport can do it. Uh, we are missing the goal uh, nine, uh, which is um, obtaining a sustainable infrastructure and uh, supporting the innovation. Sport can do it. You can do it. We are missing the goal 10, which is um, reducing inequalities and making sure that no one is left behind. It shall be there. Sport shall be uh, for all 70s. Thank you. I, sorry, I should have explained a little bit better, because um, I actually had exactly the same question when I first joined the IOC. And it's totally not that we're not doing that work, but... We're doing that work, but that work is part of the core of what we are in the Olympics. So reducing inequalities, et cetera, it's the core of what we do. However, we wanted to go above and beyond. So the sustainability strategy is, the whole point of it is to try and bring in where we were lacking slightly and focus our efforts in the near future on trying to catch up with some of the other programs within the IOC and Olympics. So it's definitely not that we're ignoring the others. And a lot of our programs um, actually cover all of them, or some of them grouped together. But um, it was my fault. I didn't explain it properly, sorry. But these are the ones which the IOC sustainability strategy are focusing more on because we felt we were lacking in those areas. Uh, but maybe kind of monopolize the mic. I'm going to pass it on in a second. Uh, Thomas Bolland from the United Nations Office uh, for Human Rights. And I just wanted to say a few words of encouragement also. And thank you very much to the organizers for getting us together. In our office about three years ago, nobody had an idea about sports. Sport was simply not an issue. Then came uh, the World Cup in Russia. And uh, we have been working on and off with Federico and his team. And I think we are making great progress. I've just come back from Moscow, and we are planning there, for example, in Russia, uh, to have a legacy of the World Cup, together with all the different host cities, together with different other stakeholders, civil society, uh, minority groups, um, and the human rights commissioners. And I think this interaction and this pushing a project through in Russia wouldn't have come without the possibility of the World Cup and working also with uh, FIFA. So uh, thank you very much to the organizers of getting, uh, for getting us together from time to time and uh, making those corporations uh, possible. Now, as I promised, I'll pass the mic and not monopolize it. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you very much to all of you for your really important work. Um, my name is Alan Hershkowitz. I'm a founding director of Sport and Sustainability International. I have a question for uh, Dan Redding uh, for sailing. Um, as you know, plastics, ocean pollution is an enormous issue. I think the United Nations estimated that there's about five trillion pieces of plastics in the ocean. Could you tell us um, about the kind of work that you're doing on that issue um, and what your prognosis is for being effective on it? Um, yeah, well, we have, uh, so 
some of our sanctioned events, so as an example, the Volvo Ocean Race, they're having um, a, a massive drive on um, ban the use of single-use plastic. Um, so within all of their events that they're having, um, they've put um, within the bid requirements, there's no single-use plastic. In terms of what, as a governing body, we can do, we're looking at changing some of the ways that, um, it, within our Agenda 2030, which align with the Sustainable Development Goals, about banning the use of single-use plastics at our events, um, trying to roll that out to um, the events that we control, but then obviously trying to influence the national events. Um, I think we are in a strong um, position to kind of educate people about... We, we have people who are out in the middle of the ocean but can see firsthand um, some of the, um, the plastic kind of patches and reporting back to, to people that are non-sailors but just some of the evidence that, that we've seen because we're going to the kind of the, the ends of the earth. Um, and obviously 70% of the planet's water but it's trying to get the message across to the person who is perhaps playing another sport um, about their use of single-use plastic but how it can ultimately end up in the ocean. So working with um, um, other sports different platforms to just raise that awareness. The, are you getting support from the um, corporations that involved in um, what, production of plastics and marketing of plastics? Um, well, within our sort of scope, within our sponsorship um, sort of uh, agreements, um, we, have, we can influence those kind of people, but I suppose people that are producing plastics in other areas, we, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to, to influence that. But again, really trying to get, I suppose, the participants of sport to, um, to, to take that message on and themselves use their consumer power to perhaps change, change the way that um, packaging and um, recyclability of plastics um, is currently um, in effect. I think if I could just add to this, um, because we haven't actually announced this yet, but... Um, Dan and I and a few other federations are teaming up with UN Environment on their Clean Seas program and the IOC ourselves to make pledges and raising awareness in single-use plastic. So it's something that we're currently working on sort of behind the scenes, but it, again, it's about collaboration, so bringing the federations in, such as World Sailing, who can make a difference to raise awareness as much as possible. Thank you. It's Nadim Nassif from uh, Lebanon, Notre Dame University in Lebanon. I have a question concerning uh, good health and well-being. How easy it is to promote physical ev activity for everyone in, a, in an elite sport environment where the goal is really to choose the best and systematically, consequently, to exclude a lot of people? So how would you respond to this in terms of uh, the SDG related to uh, good health and well-being? Um. I think, just jumping on that one, I think absolutely all of us are um, exceptionally well-placed to, um, to deliver on that because although we might organise international competition, what we all want is participation. So trying to get as many people into sports in the different varieties. So, I mean, just within sailing, we have, you know, windsurfing to bigger boat sailing to small boat sailing, and so coastal communities and inland sailing. So we have lots of strategies to get people into sport, um, so it's not just about the elite um, athletes. Yes, there is definitely um, um, two, two, two ways to look at sports, and, and I think um, international federations have to look at those two ways, which are the sports um, as, as, for, as a mean in itself, and then you would look at elite competition and elite athletes, Olympic, Olympics uh, being the goal, and then you also as an international federation and as a specialist of your sport, you can also develop projects or programs which are uh, using sports as a, as a way to go for a development and uh, development projects. And then the idea is to rather uh, spread uh, sports grass in a grassroots way. And definitely, I think all of us, um, all of our federations, they have projects in that area as well. Mm -hmm which is also heavily relying on the member national federations and then the local, it's just like a, a snow, uh, snowball effect. Yeah. And if I might add, some of the National Olympic Committees, like the Danish, for example, um, they have, they're working very closely with the government on pushing, they've got some huge targets in the country of getting people active. Um, and what's really nice about it is that they want to work with us on how other NOCs and other governments and other countries can implement the same and learn from what they have learned in their programme to replicate it around the world. So sport is definitely an enabler of that. 
Um, oh. We have time for one last question. <laughs> There's two who have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna fight so for it. <laughs> I, I would just want to comment. It seems that okay. at least on the SDG 5 we're doing pretty, yeah, pretty good today because it's a good uh, gender Balance. equality here in the room, which is a good sign. At least in sustainability, we have a, we have a good uh, gender balance. So let's let's end with uh, Mrs. Thank you so there. much. Uh, I'm Dawn Goodwin, uh, Global Head of Youth and Sport for Development from a charity called United Purpose that works in international development, formerly International Inspiration, the legacy programme from the London 2012 Olympic Games. I just have a question around engagement with civil society. It's great to hear some of you mention working with uh, charity partners. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about some of the maybe challenges and opportunities and strategy around working with civil society because in goal 17 we're talking about partnerships for for achieving the sdgs um, and i'm conscious there's like fight for peace are doing some great work in using uh, martial arts and boxing in delivering on the sdgs and football is being used very widely um, and the 2020 agenda of the ioc talks about engaging with society so i just wonder if you could say a little bit more about how that's working and if there's room for better kind of engagement and a more strategic coordination with, with civil society in using sport for the SDGs. Thank you. Well, if I can just mention something, I have partners uh, which are very different, like I believe everyone, but in my projects I have also I established a new partnership this year with charities. I've just been last week, I was in uh, north of Wales, and uh, we organized an event with uh, a local outdoor partnership foundation. So for them, it was the first time they organized, uh, they were organizing an international event. And uh, I think, well, it may sound obvious, but a good partnership is based on mutual collaboration. So for example, we have as the UIA, as my federation, we have more experience with communication and promotion of an event. So we were, even if they were the local partner, they were supposed to do the local promotion. We gave many tips, we, we help a lot uh, in deciding what to do. But of course, they could be very helpful with the, with the logistics. So they provide many volunteers to be there on the same day of the event. And uh, they, of course, know the location. So I have to trust them. I think it reconnects to what we said before, when you share what you have, the, the know-how, and also your, when you make it clear in the beginning what you need. For example, if you say, yeah, I would like to have on the event at least 50 people, a maximum 130, because this is our capacity, then it's up to the, to your, to the partner to, to see if they can, uh, can make it. But in then every case, it's very, it's peculiar, so it's very difficult to say. But my experience, even working with charities, even if they lack maybe an international experience, uh, it's maybe even easier than working with big organizations sometimes, because they are more structured. So you have to get in that structure and, uh, and make it work with yours. So I think uh, there, is, there is a lot to do together, even with uh, organizations which are different from ours, so not just part federation, but as I said, uh, feder member federations, so nationals and, and charities. Okay, th thank you very much. I am looking at David, our master <laughs> of ceremony, <laughs> and I think if we want to keep the pace, I we think should right stop cool. there and th say a big thank you to our panelists, to Julie. Absolutely. Thank you all very much indeed for that. Uh, I think the, there, there's a message already. Well, it's twofold. If you've got a question, get in early. Uh, secondly, good news is we've got other panels to run through the day. You'll get your chance for questions. I think even one or two of those questions might be reflected well in some of the other panel sessions. So have a careful look as to where you might place the question. But thank you very much indeed for getting us off to a cracking start. Could I just say, it's coffee now. We will, I'm going to start pairing back the time. So we will start at five past 11 like it or not. Um, enjoy your coffee. Could I just ask the next...